In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Dear Reverend Father Rector, dear Father, my dear sisters, my dear faithful, this past week, a story that's somewhat local to us here appeared in the national news. Only about 50 miles from here in the city of Lawrence, somebody has opened a witch-themed store, they say, in order to, to cater to a growing population of pagans in the area, a growing population of pagans. And most people would think of this as something just to, to chuckle at, imagining cartoon witchcraft, black hats and broomsticks and cauldrons and the like. Yet as Catholics, we know that, that witchcraft and paganism are serious things because they're all about dealing with demonic spirits, spirits that are real and spirits that are quite powerful. And undoubtedly in the world around us today, we, we see a greater and greater acceptance of those things that are explicitly demonic. I think most of us recall the, the well-publicized black masses that took place in Oklahoma City a couple of times in the last few years. And certainly this overt diabolic activity is disturbing. But it's not the sort of activity of the devil that's the greatest danger for us. The devil with hooves and horns and, and a tail might appeal to some sort of strange nerds who have played too many fantasy video games, but it doesn't appeal that much to us. It's not really attractive to us, this image. But that doesn't mean that we're immune from the influence of the devil. Far from it. Yes, this world of, of pure spirits is, is real. The devils are real. Holy Scripture mentions the devil and demons throughout. From the start of Holy Scripture to the end. The Old Testament, the New Testament. From the serpent in chapter 3 of Genesis up until the dragon in the book of the Apocalypse. From the very first book to the very last, we find these mentions of the devil and of his influence in the world. There are well over a hundred specific references. And in the collect of today's Mass, we prayed to be spared from this diabolic influence. Grant to thy people, we beseech thee, O Lord, to avoid the defilements of the devil and with a pure mind to follow thee, the only God to avoid the defilements of the devil. Yes, Satan and the devils are real. They, are, they were created by God with an excellent nature. They are angelic spirits. Their nature is far above anything in the visible world, far above us. St. Paul calls them principalities and powers, emphasizing their strength, their intelligence, which is far above our intelligence. They understand things much more clearly than we do. They're much more perceptive of cause and effect. And they can act upon the physical world. They're able to act upon us, to play on the weaknesses of our physical nature, to deceive us with images and suggestions. And they seduce us with what is appealing to us. They prefer this to frightening us. And likewise, their most useful servants are not those people wearing I Love Satan t-shirts and organizing black masses. Rather, those who are their most useful servants are much more subtle. Often they don't even realize that they're doing the work of the devil. Non serviam. I will not serve. This is the cry of the devil in response to God. And it's become the, the mantra of the, of the demons and of those under satanic influence. And it's one, it's a phrase, it's an attitude that appeals to every weakness in our fallen nature. I will not serve. You see it sometimes in, in even the youngest school kids. They break the rules just for the sake of breaking the rules, for some little thrill. 
even if there's no particular advantage to be gained. And that same basic flaw is in every one of us. We always want to judge things ourselves. We want to be our own boss. We imagine that the order established by God is subject to our acceptance of it, as if we were God and not he. This spirit makes us subject to the devil, subject to his influence. We end up enslaving ourselves to the demands of our lower nature and enslaving ourselves to Satan himself. This does not mean that every sin that we commit is the direct result of some kind of diabolical influence. There's an old story told of of a monastery where there was a young monk who in the middle of the night, one night, got very hungry. And so he got up to find himself some food and he went into the, into the kitchen and stole himself an egg. And he thought, well, how am I going to cook this egg? And then the idea occurred to him, well, I can take oil from the sanctuary lamp and start a fire with that to cook my egg. So he did just that and ate his egg. And a, a few days later, Consumed by the guilt of what he had done, he went and confessed his sin to the abbot, who said to him, how did you ever even think of something so terrible to steal the oil from the sanctuary lamp, from that symbol of our Lord's presence in the tabernacle? And the young monk said, the devil tempted me and I fell. And suddenly there was a great rush of wind through the monastery and a door blew open and the light went out. And this voice from the depths of the abyss said, I never even thought of it. We don't always need Satan's influence in order to do wrong. We have a fallen nature. We have our own weaknesses. We can't blame everything on him. But we are moving in the same direction as Satan every time we sin. Sin is a rejection in practice of the sovereignty of God. And thus it is, in a way, an adherence to the very rebellion of Satan. And it becomes much worse when we make peace with our sins, when we justify them, when we make excuses for them, tell ourselves that they're not so bad. Non serviam, I will not serve. The devils take every opportunity to whisper it in our ears. And when we give in, we thwart the work of God in our souls. The wounds in our lower nature are echoing the same sentiments. I will not serve. We need to know this tendency in ourselves and reject it forcefully as often as we notice it. And the devils reach us very often with this this message of non serviam through their allies in the world around us. And very often we are far too comfortable in associating with those allies of Satan. Again, I'm not talking about the card-carrying, self-professed Satanists. Rather, they are those who, who try to sell us an attractive rebellion against God's order. We know in theory, I think most of us anyway, that the modern entertainment industry in particular is against everything that we as Catholics are supposed to love and hold dear. And it's in favor of everything that we as Catholics are meant to oppose and to hate. And yet we love it. We still indulge liberally in the music, the movies, the video games, the social media that are animated with a truly diabolical spirit. It's all about egoism, self-indulgence, never the presentation of a really Catholic ideal. Perhaps it's not directly encouraging us to worship Satan, but it's encouraging to worship ourselves, which amounts to the same thing. That's what Satan does. He worships himself. And when we worship ourselves and put ourselves at the center of the universe, we follow the rebellion of Satan. We often think that a movie is good if it's entertaining, has no explicit impurity, and has no foul language. That's an awfully low standard. And there are a lot of things that don't fall under that category that turn up in movies very often that are very bad for us. Especially the spirit of rebellion against authority. Rebellion against authority. 
It's everywhere. In how many movies is the authority the bad guy? The parents are the bad guy. The civil authorities are the bad guy. The religious authorities are the bad guy. That's a spirit that gets passed on to us and to our children when we indulge in this trash. And that spirit of rebellion is a thousand times worse than the worst swear words. I think there's no comparison. There's no comparison. We have to be on our guard against these things. This spirit of rebellion is the spirit of rock music. It's everywhere in it. This rejection of the order established by God, this rejection of authority, and yet we treat it like it's no big deal. That's what we should think of in terms of the diabolical, not thinking in terms of horns and hooves, but rather this spirit of rejection of God's order that is everywhere in the world today and especially in our, in our entertainment. Certainly there are powerful forces ranged against our salvation and ranged against the, the reign of our Lord in the world. The devils are powerful. And if we had no help against them, we would have every reason to despair. But we must not forget the abundant helps that we do have. We have the grace of God. We have the sacraments, the sacramentals. We have devotion to Our Lady and to the saints. And as we find ourselves between the, the feast of the great St. Michael this past Friday and the feast of the guardian angels tomorrow, it behooves us to, to remember also our allies of the angelic order. Chapter 12 of the Apocalypse reads, And there was a great battle in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. And they prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And that great dragon was cast out, that old serpent who is called the devil and Satan, who seduces the whole world. And he was cast unto the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. St. Michael and the good angels have already been victorious in this battle with Satan and his devils. They will never be defeated by these demons because they fight with the power of God on their side. And St. Michael has been given to us as a special patron in these latter times, especially since that vision of Leo XIII towards the end of the 19th century that caused him to compose the, the prayer to St. Michael that we say after every low mass. We should say this prayer. It's an invocation of the great archangel against these diabolic powers. And while we're on the subject, as a practical note, very often people don't say amen at the end of the prayer when it's recited after low mass because the priest doesn't. The priest isn't supposed to, but you are supposed to. So when you conclude the prayer, do say amen. Ratify that, that invocation of the this great archangel against the powers of hell. Satan can only flee from St. Michael, and St. Michael will come to our aid if we invoke him. I have a friend who's a priest whose brother was, some years back, was eating dinner in a, in a bar and restaurant, and while he was doing so, a very strange young woman came in. She looked disturbed and unsettled, um, was dressed oddly, and acting very strangely, sort of twitchy. And um, she began to, to go around the bar and, and offer to uh, read people's palms, tell their fortunes for money. And my friend's brother was, was unsettled by this, and so he began to recite the prayer to St. Michael under his breath. And the reaction was immediate. The, the young lady started up, looked around, and left the bar very quickly without ever having been able to hear a word that this young man was saying. It is a powerful prayer. Holy Scripture tells us infallibly that St. Michael has defeated Satan, and we must have faith in his help. Likewise, each of us has a guardian angel. We celebrate their feast tomorrow. Our Lord himself alludes to this truth. When, speaking of little children, he said, See that you despise not one of these little ones, for I say to you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Yes, each of us, even little children, have an angel assigned to us. And the Catechism of the Council of Trent says, By God's providence, angels have been entrusted with the office of guarding the human race 
and of accompanying every human being so as to preserve him from any serious dangers. And we tend to think mostly in terms of physical dangers. And in Holy Scripture, we do see these physical interventions of the angels, most notably perhaps the the angel St. Raphael saving Tobias from the, from the attack of the fish. And such physical actions do take place, but they are not the most important in our lives. Our guardian angel is firstly a spiritual ally. The Catechism goes on to tell us that God wills us to be protected by an angel, that we may be enabled to escape the snares secretly prepared by our enemy, repel the dreadful attacks he makes on us, and under our angel's guiding hand, keep the right road, and thus be secure against all false steps which the wiles of the evil one might cause us to make in order to draw us aside from the path that leads to heaven. Be secure against all false steps which the wiles of the evil one might cause us to make. Yes, we must invoke our guardian angel. That's why he's been given to us. In our temptations, in those attacks of the devil, we must call upon his help. This world of angelic spirits is real. It's important. And like the world of men, it's divided into those angels that are for and against our Lord Jesus Christ, for and against God. The devils know that they cannot defeat the good angels who are already saved, and so they focus their attention on us. They attack us. And we can certainly protect ourselves with the help of our angelic allies. By praying to them and asking for their aid, certainly, and that is important, but also by trying to imitate them, to imitate their spirit of total submission to the will of God. As the psalmist says, bless the Lord, all ye his angels, you that are mighty in strength and execute his word, hearkening to the voice of his orders. Execute his word, hearkening to the voice of his orders. Let us ask today, Our Lady, Queen of the Angels, to give us that same spirit, that we might execute the word of God, hearkening to the voice of his orders, and so attain the, the same reward as the angels, and live in perfect bliss with our Lord Jesus Christ and the Blessed Virgin Mary forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.